Can you hear me at the back? Wave if you can hear me. Wave if you can hear me. At the back. The man in the fetching yellow can definitely hear me. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry you're kind of out here this evening, but you understand the issue. Last year we had um, about we had last year we had about 2,000 people at the rally inside. This year it's even bigger and better than that. And so. Obviously, there is a limit to the number of people you can get in any one place, and so unfortunately, some of you are going to have to be outside here, and I'm really sorry about that. But the weather is good. As I was saying last night in York, I finished speaking at 8 o'clock, and the heavens opened at 5 past 8. So the crowd got away with only a bit of a soaking. Can I say thank you all very much for coming along? This is another rally we've held today. This afternoon we were in Hull and we had uh, thousands of people turned out in the centre of Hull. They turned out because they wanted to hear something different, because they wanted to have a different approach to politics within our society. And I have been challenged in my position as leader of the party, I fully understand that. I was challenged in the court by people with um, a lot of resources in which to make that challenge. The court found Firmly, absolutely, in our favour, that I had a right to be on the back And of the constituency Labour parties that are nominating, and many are nominating, we've already received 51 nominations as of last night from constituency parties all over, all over the country, all over the country, in all parts of the country. But what this is also about is the politics of our time and how we deal with the issues that people face. We live in a society that is grossly unequal and becoming more unequal. We live in a society where young people are told, sorry, you're going to be worse off than your parents' generation, and your children are going to be even worse off than your grandparents' generation, and there's going to be an intergenerational cascading of lowering ambitions, greater poverty, and greater inequality. This is in a world that is increasingly wealthy, and in a world that is increasingly technical, in a world where there's the most fantastic ability for us to technically do things and change things. So it's the politics that's wrong, not the technology that's wrong. It's the ability to think of how we can do things differently that is so lacking. And then you look at what is happening within our society. I'll give you just a couple of examples. This week, finally, BHS stores gone under. Philip Green, the owner, managing director, major shareholder, former government minister for efficiency, actually. Kind of interesting. Uh, lives in a tax haven and sails off in a very expensive yacht bought on the proceeds of not paying tax because he registered himself in Monaco. And what's happened? Hundreds, no, thousands of people lost their jobs. Those stores have been closed. And the job losses are not just in those stores. It goes back through the whole supply chain. There's a cascade of misery, a cascade of job losses, and a cascade of poverty that follows. He thinks he can walk away. He thinks he can play Ducks of Drakes. Surely we need a government that's prepared to intervene to protect those jobs and ensure that those people who think they're above paying taxation are brought back to reality that everybody's going to pay their fair share of tax and we're not going to tolerate tax havens and tax avoidance and tax escaping on the kind of industrial scale that goes on at the present time. The Panama Papers show a great deal of that. And then there's other examples, many other examples. Let's just give you two more. Lloyds Bank, this week, profits went up by 101%. Very big increase in their profits over one year. We, all of us, very, were really generous. In 2008, we bought Lloyds Bank, we bailed it out. It was really kind of us, wasn't it? We did it because we wanted it to succeed, we wanted it to be there. We're all shareholders in now a proportion of Lloyds Bank. 
They made these big profits, 2.5 billion profits. Now, most companies that make a big profit have some degree of social conscience and give something back to their employees. Lloyds Bank gave a lot back. 3,000 job notices to their staff and 200 branches being closed. Where was the government intervention, despite the bailout, despite the shareholding, to say to Lloyds two things? One, you can't do that. And secondly, we want an investment strategy for you that creates manufacturing jobs in this country that helps to develop the economy of this country rather than just the monetary economy, which seems to be the only thing you can understand. We want a banking system, surely, that works for the entirety of the community, not for the chief executives and the shareholders of those banks. Surely that has to be the priority. And so, when John McDonnell proposes a national investment bank with regional investment banks to go alongside it, that achieves two things. One is, it ensures there is a public investment fairly distributed across the whole of the country on capital investment projects. Why is it that uh, London gets 22 times more than the North East, for example? And you can look at the many other examples around the, around the country. And also, why we allow good inventions to take place in all of our universities and then don't fund the development of those interventions. Surely a national investment bank could ensure that we develop those jobs and develop that economy. This isn't particularly radical stuff. It's absolutely normal in Germany at the present time. Surely we can learn something from that and ensure we have that degree of investment. And then we look at these standards of employment in many places across the country. Sport Direct is built on the site of Shirebrook Colliery. My great friend, Dennis Skinner, explained very well in Parliament exactly what it was about. And he just did an intervention on a speech by John and he simply said this. He worked in Shirebrook Colliery up until he became an MP. At that time, the colliery employed people on reasonable wages. They were all unionized. They were all there together. They were in a community together. There was a strength of community about it. And they produced coal, which helped to run the industries of this country. Margaret Thatcher came along. That Tory government, with its ideological hatred of manufacturing industry and powerful trade unions, destroyed that pit, destroyed that community, destroyed that industry and has left them to the miseries of uh, lack of development, lack of expansion, drug, drug taking on a huge scale and social dislocation because there was a lack of investment in those coal field communities. What comes along and replaces that eventually? Mike Ashley in Sport Direct, zero hours contract, underpaid people getting less than the aggregate of the minimum wage, the ambulance called frequently because of people falling ill in this dangerous working, in dangerous working conditions. Fire engines frequently called, and so on. Abominable and appalling working conditions, which even an all-party select committee condemned. What is it about modern Britain that we tolerate these kind of working practices, this degree of exploitation, and then blame the workers in the factory for the condition they're suffering, rather than So we have a lot of ideas on employment law. One of them, first, is end the scandal of zero hours contracts and the insecurity that goes with it. Secondly, end the scandal of charging people, potentially with huge costs, for having the temerity to take an injustice to an employment tribunal. Surely that is wrong and has to be dealt with. And thirdly, giving people positive rights of work and representation, positive rights to be represented at all stages. So we repeal the Trade Union Act and replace it with a positive rights of work agenda. And I've asked Ian Lavery, MP, to undertake what we call Workplace 2020, which is a discussion with unions, yes, with small employers and big employers, yes, and with self-employed people about their working conditions, their access to benefits, their access to training, and their access to support. That is 
our party reaching out to everyone to say we're going to put together a strategy for proper rights of work, but also recognizing that workers have an enormous amount to contribute to a company. How many of you in your workplace think of all the things you could do better than the people that manage you from some distant place? Hands up. And are you given the chance to do that? No, you're often ignored. Surely. The asset of any country, the asset of any organization, are the people that actually do the work and build it. So that has to be the right way to look at it. So it's a question of the mentality of how you look at people. And there are many other things within our society before I come on to some uh, points about how we go forward. Our health service, for example, is something I'm intensely proud of, the fact that we have a national health service free at the point of use as a human right. Most, most people, people in most, most countries, countries, most, most parts, parts of the world, don't, don't enjoy, enjoy that, that sense of security. security. All, All of us know that if we have an accident, accident on our way home this evening, evening an, ambulance an ambulance will come, will come we will get, get to a hospital, hospital somebody, somebody will look, look after us, and, and uh, uh, however painful or bad our injuries might be, be we won't, won't be worried, worried about, about having to pay for the medical treatment we're getting. It's a fundamental security a security, a security of mentality, mentality that we have, that we in, have in this country. country. It, it didn't, didn't come, come by accident. accident. It came it because brave, brave people, people argued the case yeah, yeah. for health care yeah. as a That's human a right. Yeah. And won that yeah. argument yeah. after the Second World War. And whilst all parties now pay lip service to the principle of a national health service, in reality, it's been privatized before our very eyes. It's being stripped apart before our very eyes. 49% of all health service work is now put out, or due to be put out, to the private sector. And with the rationing of medicines, uh, because of the cost of some of them, and the insufficiency of funding in many places, the increased waiting lists and waiting times, the difficulties of discharge of often frail elderly people, because the shortage of adult social care, the health service is creaking. The social, social services, services are creaking. creaking. And at the same time, there's this almost subliminally powerful advertising campaign to appeal to those who can afford it to buy private medicine. If this goes on, if it's allowed to go on, what then happens is, instead of being the universal national health service that we've all been brought up to love and admire and rely on, it will become a health service of last resort for those who can't afford to go private. I don't want that. We are not going to let that happen. Because Healthcare is right, but there are other aspects, and I have made as much as I can of this during the 10 months since I was elected to this position, is the crisis of mental health within our society. One in four of us in this crowd, at some point in our lives, are going to go through a period of deep stress, where we'll need help, we'll reach out to people. Some of us will get that help, some of us will get that support, some of us will have very understanding partners, children, families who will help us and support us. Good. Some of us will get the help we need. How many will suffer in silence, afraid to talk to anybody about the stress they're going through? How many people will be frightened to tell their employer they're going through mental health stress because they'd fear for their career prospects? How many students and young people, school children and others, would be frightened to talk about their stress levels because of the stigma attached to it? We can do two things. One is, we can end the abuse of people with mental health conditions by the language that's used, the comedy language that's used, the abuse that's heaped on them. And secondly, we can fund our mental health services properly so that we are saying we as a society do not pass by on the other side and we recognize that a mental health condition is a health condition just the same as if you've got appendicitis or a broken leg. Deal with it in that way. And there are many, many other issues that we've been trying to focus on during the past year. But I can, if I can, if I may, give you a couple of examples. The education service is something, is something that, that we all, all value, value, obviously. But, but there is there an is underfunding, underfunding going, going in it. it. 
There is. There is um, now, now, cuts, cuts in, in school, school budgets, budgets for the first time for 20 or 30 years, years at any, any level. level. And, and there, there is, is a change, change in the funding, funding formula, which often hits many inner city schools very hard. And schools that have um, a large, a large number, number of children of the working poor end up worse off than schools that have got children of uh, parents who have neither of whom are able to work and relying entirely on benefits. So a lot of it is extremely unfair. So we need to be funding our schools properly. But well, the one thing we don't need is what this government tried to do, which was forced academization of schools, which they were sold into the middle of the budget. And that forced academization would have meant that uh, every school would have to become an academy. Every school would then be walking away from national pay arrangements for teaching staff, for non-teaching staff, for all the other people that make up the team that are so important in a school. Why did the government back off on that? They backed off on that because it was pushed in the middle of a budget. It was opposed very strongly by us immediately in Parliament, opposed by the teachers' unions, opposed by an awful lot of people all around the country. I'll tell you this, when you stand up against these Tories, immediately, strongly, and in a very determined way, they back off. We've defeated them 22 times. So, our detectives who claim that our opposition to them is ineffective, I say to them, look at the record of what we've achieved in the past six months. Look at what we could achieve working flat out together to oppose what the Tories are doing. Flat out together, telling them where they're wrong and the kind of world that we want to create. So there are many, many issues that we face as a party, but let's look at something, a couple of very, very positive things. Party membership for the Labour Party was around 200,000 at the time of the last general election. I got a statement this week from our party head office of the current membership, 543,000. And in 48 hours, 183,000 people registered to vote in this leadership election, rather more than the entire membership of the Conservative Party over the whole UK voted to register to take part in our leadership election. So this election is about the direction that our party goes. It is about an economic policy that is saying austerity is a political choice not an economic necessity. It's a political choice that creates greater and greater inequality within our society. It's a political choice that has been made by this government, was tragically to some extent made by our party in the past, in the 2015 election, we had many good things in our manifesto, but also was a proposal that there should be a continuing or a continuation of the public sector wage freeze and cuts in public expenditure. We are no longer saying that. We are no longer using that language. We're a party of investment. We're a party of expansion. We're a party of properly funding public services for the good of all and not punishing public sector workers for the work that they do. And it's about the future that we offer to people all over this country. Poverty is a terrible thing. Housing inequality and injustice is a terrible thing. People sleeping on the streets is a terrible thing. Is it necessary? Is it right? No. Why does it come about? It wasn't always like that. There was a time when there were very few, if almost nobody, sleeping on the streets. There was a time when the majority of people were decently housed. Since we've allowed the free market to let rip on the private sector, since we've encouraged the destruction of council housing as a concept, since we've turned housing associations into housing companies that are doing as much development for free market sale, and often more than they are for social renting, we're building in a crisis, a crisis of children being brought up in overcrowded, insecure, expensive, private rented accommodation, of families being driven out of council housing by aggressive development policies in some inner city areas, and saying that council housing is somewhere or other a thing of the past. I tell you this, 
The housing crisis at the end of the Second World War was dealt with by successive governments that invested in housing for all, provided that security of tenure and security of living for many families. I want a Labour government that's going to invest again in secure lifetime tenancies for council tenants. And I want a government also that's going to regulate the private rented sector to end the scandal of six month tenancies and local authorities being given the encouragement and the power to introduce low interest rate mortgages for first time buyers as a way of getting everybody an opportunity of somewhere to live. Too many people are living in a very insecure way and think of the effect on children being brought up in a succession of private rented flats, moving every few months, sometimes moving schools every few months, and what it does to their psyche, what it does to their sense of community, what it does to their health, and what it does to their educational achievement. We can, should, must, and will invest in housing for all to ensure we end the housing crisis. But our society is not just built on these things, it's also built on the achievements of many who make a contribution. Uh, I meet many students that are travelling around the country, those doing good apprenticeships, and some of them are doing great apprenticeships and doing really well, and I admire them for it, and support those companies that have those good quality apprenticeships. Some of them are not. Some of them are very inadequate apprenticeships, which are actually a substitute for low wages. And that has to end. We need proper regulation and proper control. We also need to look at the issue, look at it hard the issue of students and student debt. Why is it a whole generation is now growing up with um, leaving the university with up to £50,000 worth of debt? The day she was appointed Prime Minister, Theresa May said she was concerned about inequality in Britain. Good. I'm glad she's noticed that there's inequality in Britain. She's obviously received some very good information on this. And she made some quite good remarks about it. The following day, in Parliament, they introduce another Higher Education Act, which ends all grants, ends all supports, the same government ending nurse bursaries, and then lifting the cap on student fees that have gone from zero to a thousand to three thousand to nine thousand, and now to the sky. What are we saying to a generation of young people? who want, want to become, become the engineers, the architects, the lawyers, the doctors, or whatever, whatever profession they choose of the future. future. Oh, what, are what are we saying to them? them? Sorry, Sorry, you can't, can't do, it do it because you haven't got, got enough, enough money, money, or you're going to be in debt for the rest of your life to pay for it. We've commoditized education when we should have been expanding education as a right and an access for all. Because if somebody is well educated and well trained, well educated and well trained, it's good for them, of course, of course it is, obviously, but it's also good for all of us. We then get better industrial development, we get better quality trains, we get better quality buildings, we get all that because we all benefit from the education of everybody else. Poverty is such a waste. Think of all those wonderful people that could have been engineers, could have been artists, could have been architects, could have been musicians, before there was any education available for the majority of people. All that talent was lost to us. Are we to create a society that's so divided that because somebody grows up in a working class family, not with a great deal of money, chooses not to go to university, their genius is lost to the rest of us. Shouldn't we instead approach it on the basis that there is genius in all of us that has to be unlocked by educational opportunity for all of us? And a society that doesn't ration access to culture, Ration, ration access to music, to theatre, to art, to those that can afford it, but gives every one of our children the chance to learn music, to paint, to draw, to think, to be imaginative. Can't we have a society where culture, culture is not a barrier, but something that's open for all of us and recognise the genius that's there in all of us? I feel very, very strongly on these things.
So this, is, this leadership election campaign is at one level about our Labour Party, but it's also about the opportunities and the attitudes we take to what we do in the future. Our rights came from people that contributed a huge amount to us. The right to vote came by those that demonstrated for it, worked for it, and many sadly died for it in the 19th century and before. The right of women to vote came because of the bravery of the suffragettes and many others who suffered grievously in order to get the right to vote. Right to vote. And today in Hull, I was saying they should extol the virtues of a woman who had her childhood and youth near Hull in Beverly, Mary Wollstonecroft, who wrote the treatise on the rights of women. Because it's those icons that thought through the issue, they inspired others to campaign for it. So we win so many of those rights. Those things were achieved. We've achieved a lot. The principle of Social Security, the principle of a National Health Service, the Equalities Act, Disability Discrimination Act, Human Rights Act, all those things have been achieved because people stood up, were counted and tried to make things go forward in a good way. That's what we have built our successes on. We now have a government and a philosophy in power which wants to walk away from those things, wants to repeal the Human Rights Act doesn't care about the levels of inequality and injustice within our society and wants Britain to become a sort of offshore island of Europe where there is uh, low tax for the rich, even lower corporation tax for big business, no real protection on wages and working conditions, making us a sort of bargain basement offshore economy for spivs to make a great deal of money. Or are we to say we want to be a society that works for all, works with all people, uses the creativity of everybody and builds that sense of unity and community within our society. After the um, vote on the European Union, there was a horrible outbreak of uh, hate crime, of racist violence, and unpleasantness within our society. I just simply say this, if there's a shortage of housing, a shortage of school places, a shortage of doctors, it is not the responsibility of people that need schools, houses, and education, and health care, it is the responsibility of a government that's not investing in them. If we turn in and turn against each other, we achieve nothing. Prejudice and hate never built a house, never built a school, never trained a nurse, only led to more prejudice, more hate. It's a cycle to nowhere other than a nasty, divided community. Tonight, we're a big crowd here in Leeds. We are people who come together and achieve things together. When we work together, think together, talk together, we achieve together, we create that sense of justice and common endeavor within our society. When we allow ourselves to be divided, we go down the road that the only thing that matters is competition, and the only thing that matters is defeating the person next to you, you end up in a very difficult and not very happy place. I know what kind of society I want to live in. I know what kind of endeavor I want my party to put in to this, this election, election campaign, campaign now, now, but, but above, above all, it's the election campaign, campaign that starts on September the 24th to win a general election, election to defeat this Tory government. And that is going to be to develop a society, to develop a society. Where there's free water for all. <laughs> Yorkshire water. Good, good quality, quality Yorkshire, Yorkshire water that will make good quality yeah. Yorkshire tea. Yeah. And unlocks the potential in all of us. But also recognises that we have to think very differently about the rest of the world, about human rights around the world, and a foreign policy that puts human rights at the forefront of it, not things like the disaster of the Iraq war instead, which is something that I very strongly oppose but also looks at the environmental issues that face our society, the environmental issues that face our globe. 
we, we shouldn't, shouldn't be frightened, frightened of it, but we should we see the technology, the technology that's available to us as an opportunity to create a more sustainable economy, sustainable environment, encourage and enhance the biodiversity that we all need in which to live. We achieve these things by working together. You can't do it on your own. So our party is about bringing people together. It is about that kind of society we're going to create. It is about ending the injustice, the inequality, and the way in which some people are so badly treated in our society. That's why the Labour Party was founded. That is the coalition that is the Labour Party that can bring about that fantastic change in our society. And I tell you what, it's very exciting trying to achieve it. But I also, I also say, say to those, those people, people in our party, party that, that think, think um, all of this is impossible, is impossible. We, we lost, lost two, two elections, elections because, because we, we weren't, weren't offering something, something that was sufficiently attractive <laughs> to people in this country. We weren't offering to deal with the fundamental levels of inequality within our society. And somehow or other we were embarrassed about our past, our principles, and what we were really about. Let's be proud of what we are. Let's be proud of our principles. Let's be proud of our past. But above all, let's be very confident about a future. A future that does give real hope, real chance, and real opportunity for everybody within our society. That's what social justice is about. That is what social values are about. That is what caring for the entire community is really all about. And that is what makes the politics of this country now so exciting, what's happening in the USA, in Europe, and what is happening in many other parts of the world, where people are coming together and saying, and I conclude with this point, because I'm being ushered into the other hall, um, conclude with this point, that we've had 40 years of being lectured that all that matters is uh, withdrawing the state from public services, rolling back the role of the state in education, in health, in housing, in land management, environment and everything else, in order to create greater levels of inequality that somehow or other the super rich might spend a bit which will trickle down to the rest of us. Well, it hasn't worked very well, has it? So, isn't it time we did something different? Did something, did something collective, collective. Did, did something, something that ensures the, the next, next generation, generation is better off than we are. are. And the, the generation, generation after that is better off than that generation. generation. So, so we bequeath, bequeath a, greater a greater and better future, future to the to next generation, generation rather than, than one, one of misery. misery. Let's, Let's not, not pull, pull up the ladder on the on generations the that come behind us, us but, but strengthen that, that ladder that they may achieve even more than we are able to achieve ourselves. Thank you very much.